Next up is Tom Polina. He's going to speak to us about stormwater. Stormwater is really one of the major issues that relates to the quality of our waters, the amount of water we have to use for our drinking water supplies and for stream flow. Stormwater is one of the biggest remaining pollution sources we have on water quality because of all the work we've done over the last 30 or 40 years to build wastewater plants, to do pollution reduction with industries. But it's the stormwater, the water that washes off our streets, our buildings, and going off and directly into our water bodies. That's one of the biggest sources of the phosphorus, the nitrogen that you heard about, the cyanobacteria bacteria, other pollutants like fecal coliform and bacteria that can make us sick. And so there's been a concerted effort by many communities, often driven by the regulatory rules that they face, to address their stormwater in comprehensive ways. And we're lucky to have Tom. He works with AST Environmental. He's spent a good part, if not most of his career, focused on managing stormwater and helping communities manage it in a way that's responsible and affordable. So Tom, with that, welcome. Well, I'd like to talk to you today about a a couple of projects that we think have been very successful locally here, Kingston Bay and Duxbury Bay, right on the west side of Cape Cod Bay, just north of the town of Plymouth. So our project really uh, uh, extends over uh, quite an area here in the two bays. Uh, and as you can see, um, Duxbury Bay, the town of Duxbury and Snug Harbor t to the top of the uh, slide is the one area that was done a lot of work in and the nook, and then the project area extends southerly into the Jones River uh, watershed and in the mouth of the Jones River. And this program has been going on since 2002, and we just updated it to 16 this year. So the question is, why, why were we doing these things? What got the two towns, specifically uh, Duxbury, getting started in 2002? Well, these two bays are home to a lot of recreational and commercial shell fishing and specifically uh, oyster farming. And so uh, it was important to the people in the town of Duxbury to try and maximize the protection of the receiving waters by at least getting the first flush of stormwater contamination out of that uh, discharge pipe. So here we see uh, some oyster cages ready to go to work in uh, Duxbury. They just sit there with their little oysters and the tide comes and it goes and comes and it goes. And and these critters grow until we get to all enjoy them in the summertime. But that was one of the motivations for this work. In the town of Kingston, uh, the Jones River estuary and the mouth of the river and the, and the bay uh, were a very uh, attractive area. There's a lot of recreation, boating, the town landing is in the mouth of the, of the Jones River. And there's a number of uh, seasonal residents that are uh, uh, right there, a lot of summertime activity. So that was the motivation in, in the town of Kingston. Over the course of uh, from 2002 to 2016, there were 17 grants totaled uh, to uh, $1.65 million. All of this work was done through grant studies were done with grants. Construction was done with grants. The grant agency, for the most part, is uh, CZM here in Massachusetts the, uh, and the Coastal Pollutant Remediation Grant Program. And if any of you uh, haven't heard of it, you ought to take advantage of it because uh, every year you can chop off a little bit of, of uh, stormwater mitigation that otherwise would be uh, uh, flowing into your streams or your bays. Uh, what I've highlighted here in blue are the, are the studies. Um, what would typically happen is there would be a study, there would be some conclusions drawn from the study, we would develop some designs to mitigate certain outfalls, the priorities of which were, were identified in the studies, and then we would get a grant for the construction. And each study would generate three or four years of construction, and then we go back to another study and pick out some more outfalls. Um, there were a total of 35 outfalls sampled, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but 35 outfalls in these two communities were tested during wet weather events to decide which ones were the worst offenders. And at the end of the day, 10 of them were mitigated over this long 14-year period. That is to say, the first flush, designed to capture the first flush of runoff, which is the first inch of runoff, in a storm event uh, was completed using these, these grant programs. So in Duxbury, the focus started in Snug Harbor in the upper right-hand corner. That's a little village in the town of Duxbury. The, the 
There's one single large outfall there, and that's why the uh, town wanted to attack that one first. There's a marina there, a marina school. Uh, the the uh, Duxbury Yacht Club is up there. It's, it's a very pretty area and, um, and a lot of recreation going on. Um, further to the south, Halls Corner, uh, also known as South Duxbury. That, uh, that area is rel has a relatively high commercial area for the town of Duxbury anyway. And uh, it has a single outfall as well, uh, going to the southwest uh, there. And then along Bay Road, that is, which is the main road uh, town to town going from Duxbury to Kingston, uh, there are a host of stormwater discharges, basic uh, catch basin systems. Uh, sometimes it's one catch basin, sometimes it's a network of four or five catch basins that are hooked, connected together and then discharge out. So that we, those became the the focus of the work in, uh, in Duxbury. And uh, one of the early studies that uh, was done uh, was to sample during wet weather, weather events, 10 of these outfalls and the little purple dots are the, are the outfalls that were sampled, a number along Bay Road, Crescent Street and Halls Corner and the other outfalls. And what that entailed is uh, Joe Grady, who's the uh, conservation uh, uh, agent in Duxbury, he on a rainy day would go out and stick his little cup in the outfall pipe and uh, put it in some jars and get it to a certain lab. And uh, we would measure, he would do that for two storms. And we would measure for fecal coliform concentration, uh, enterococcus concentration, and total suspended solids. And the, the bacteria um, uh, uh, parameters were measured in terms of uh, CFU, col colony forming units uh, per 100 ml. So it's sort of like a concentration. I treat it as a concentration. And um, that was done it, it, uh, by Joe uh, in the early stages of the work in, in, uh, in Duxbury. In Kingston, uh, a couple years later, Kingston uh, received a grant from uh, Mass Bays. Uh, I believe that's administ administrated by uh, Office of Coastal Zone Management as well. And um, in Kingston, we identified and, and mapped, as you can see here, about 15 different outfalls in the Jones River from the mouth south, uh, uh, westerly, and westerly. The conservation agent there, Maureen Thomas, uh, thought that it would be a good idea that we, we only had a budget to sample so many outfalls and we had a lot of outfalls there. Uh, so she sampled about 13 or 14 of these outfalls, again, in a storm event. And in her case, she had to hop in a kayak or a canoe or something to go downstream to get the sampling at the outfall point because it was right in the river. Unlike Duxbury, you could go right down the road and there was the pipe. This, in this case here, some of these outfalls were, were in a relatively remote section of the Jones River. So we would take these, her samples and Joe samples, send them to the lab, get the concentration of uh, uh, pathogens, and then we would multiply those concentrations by the uh, first flush volume of the catchment area. So if you have a, uh, uh, that would be a, a certain amount of cubic feet of volume and times the concentration of the pathogens, pathogens give us a mass. And the mass, we would then be able to compare mass of this outfall, the mass of pathogens at this outfall versus the next one and the next one and so forth. And we get a sense of which outfalls are discharging the greatest mass of pathogens into the bay and which are not quite so bad. And we try and get a sense of how to prioritize that. And so to do that, we, we kind of developed a fairly simple little matrix analysis here. And um, what you see on the right-hand column is the outfall number, the identification of the outfall. Uh, and these all have numbers because at the time we were, we were these are in Kingston, they, we, they just had a number to them. That's how we work with them. So P swale number four, that's uh, paved swale number four, that's down at the end of Delano Avenue, 195. Uh, in there in the middle is, uh, is the outfall at the Jones River Watershed Association parking lot. And uh, I think uh, 
41A is down by the uh, town landing. So these have real names to them. They're real locations. They're, they're just not pure numbers. But anyway, so the, num the, the locations are on the column on the right. The pollutant levels are on the top uh, line. You've got fecal units, enterococcus units, bay proximity, and constructability. Now, we already talked about the, the mass of pathogens at each of these outfalls. So we can look at the data there and, and identify which outfalls had the the greatest mass of contribution to the bay and which did not, those that had a, that had a high concentration compared to the others, they would get a ranking of five. We're going like one through five here. So if, it, if this was really a, a bad actor, it gets a five. It was, if it was a small section, uh, you know, not a lot of pathogens going on, then I guess a one. We did the two columns, of course, are, are the pathogens, the fecals and the enterococcus. So it is kind of weighted to the, the pathogen loading, but there's two other variables that we considered. One is the proximity to the bay. This is again in Kingston. So to the extent that we're upstream in the Jones River Basin, um, those might, one might consider to be less offensive than those that are outfalls that are discharging right at the mouth of the river itself, closest to where the, uh, where the uh, oyster farming uh, activities might be. So bay proximity was a parameter that we decided to use. Another parameter was uh, constructability. Um, are we looking at putting in a, a, a BMP, a best management practice system, in an area where there's a lot of buried utilities, water, sewer, gas, and all the individual's household service connections that are perpendicular to that? If we're going to be putting systems in the ground, we don't want to be popping everybody's water service. So, constructability became an issue and uh, to the extent that we saw that there was public land available in the right of way, utilities weren't in the way and other, other aspects then that it would be get a high number, a five, and if it was going to be a real complicated thing uh, then uh, we got a lower number to a one. So after all these samplings, 35 outfalls between the two towns, uh, prioritizing them through the little uh, matrix that we just showed you, we come up with it's time to design something. And so the, this is where the engineer gets involved. We do some drawings, and I'm not going to go into any details on this, except that these design packages that were funded by Coastal uh, CPR uh, were generally running around $125,000 for construction. It'd be like three sheets of drawings, 24 by 36 inch drawings, a set of specs only about that thick, uh, really nothing uh, extravagant at all. And uh, with that amount of investment, 125 and three sheets of drawings and the specs, you get, you get to install uh, sometimes four BMPs, uh, which can mitigate one outfall or be half of what you need to get it, mitigate a larger outfall. But the point is that um, these, these projects are not that, in, that involved, at least to the extent that the CPR program is funding them. And that's what these two towns did. Every year they would go for grant funding. So this is another $118,000 grant application. This work was done on uh, Crescent Street in Duxbury. They, you got a plan and you got details on the same sheet. Once the designs are done, we uh, put it out to bid. Uh, CPR has its own bidding cycle. Um, so you want to take advantage of that, and, uh, and the town, you know, manages the bidding process, and we go into construction. Now, you know, I think a lot of us know what the BMPs are. Uh, uh, you got subsurface leaching system. Again, going back to recharging groundwater, what we're trying to do is capture the first flush and put it back into the groundwater be, uh, rather than discharge it into the stream, or alternatively, bring it through a rain garden and get some uptake, nutrient uptake and pathogen uptake before it goes, and then it goes into the groundwater or sometimes it's out. So if rain gardens are like Tom Brady, to use a metaphor or analogy with football, if Tom Brady's the rain garden, <laughs> there's, there's a lot, there are a lot of stout concrete structures in front of him that keep him safe and pretty. <laughs> and those, 
And, and th what I'm going to do is show you some of those stout concrete structures because when we're talking about BMPs, everyone thinks a rain garden or a pretty swale or something. But there's a lot of management of the hydraulics going on here because you can't have a, a big 10-year storm blowing through your rain garden. It'll be washed all away. So you have to deflect flows here and there, and that's, that's what we do. So in this little picture here on Bay Road in, in 08, so we had, it, was very, it was fairly tight right away uh, in the street. And we, th there's an existing drain line that you can see on the left-hand uh, picture. And we exposed that drain line. We, want, we needed to put a catch basin at that location. I, I can't remember why we had to put it there, but we had to put it there. And so what we did is we exposed the drain line. Dog, we put a doghouse, they call it a doghouse, over the over the existing drain line, but we keep its integrity intact, and then we, back, we pour in concrete and surround it. That becomes now a catch basin. We put a cap on it, and you can see the piping holes and so forth. That becomes a catch basin, um, and that will go direct uh, catchment uh, flow to a uh, settling tank and then to the subsurface leaching system. And then on the, on the other side, in the same project, in this case, we expose the the existing drain line, we carve off the top half so that we can now see into the drain. As you can see, there's no flow there because there's been no rain event, so everything is dry. We go back, we doghouse that, we put a, a bench, what they call a bench, it's just co poured concrete up to the spring line, a halfway point of the pipe, and then we have a, our dis a pipe coming in. This pipe uh, coming from the top is going in, and that's the overflow pipe that would other, that's protecting the leaching system by, by capturing all the flows in excess of one inch of rain. Now, they say it's like 80% of the storms around here are less than one inch of rain, but you get those 20% that are big rain events, and two inch, three inch, four inches of rain in a 24-hour period or more, six inches in a 100-year storm can really make a mess. So you've got to be able to manage that, those excessive flows. and little things like this, the stout little defender of Tom Brady, they, they help out. Um, uh, other times we have a, we, we want to capture the flow that's in the existing storm drain, and so we uh, open up that drain and uh, put a structure in place and then put a wall in the middle of it, perpendicular to the flow. These are deflection walls. And on the left-hand side, you can see those two pictures. We put the doghouse in. We're, we've opened. We've exposed the existing drain. We're uh, putting some concrete in place to, to make a new bottom for this doghouse. And now, eventually, we Mason goes in there and he builds a deflection wall. And what we show here, a simple deflection wall. It's an eight by eight by sixteen inch uh, concrete block, or square. Or you can do the uh, the the. Um, barrel block, and the, the, the picture in the top is a barrel block configuration. You, any masonry supply place that caters to public works uh, construction has these kinds of things. So flow comes, flow now is intercepted at this new doghouse here. It comes in to the new structure, hits the wall, and is deflected over there to another place, to the leaching, which isn't shown here, to the to the uh, uh, sept uh, settling area and then to the subsurface system. And it, once the flow gets excessive, then the top of these little deflection walls is the same elevation as the top of the, of the buried leaching system. So all the, this leaching system gets filled up, water goes, instead of blasting through the leaching system, water goes up and over these weirs. It goes out like it always would have. So that's the hydraulic protection. Here's another kind of uh, BMP. Uh, this is really simple, uh, a rocky swale. We just carve out some of the Cape Cod berm that's in place and hope that, uh, and we probably could have done a better job on this one, bring gutter line flow into the, into the bermed area, I mean, into the uh, uh, swale area, which is just a lot of sand, uh, deep sand. We, I think we scratched two feet down put two feet of, uh, three feet down, two feet of sand, and then six or eight inches of stone here so that uh, we would capture some of the first flush as it's going down. And it's hard to see, but at the bottom, or that is in the top right-hand corner there, there's another break in the berm. That's sort of daylighting. In other words, the flow 
enters at the top side and then flows down into the berm, into the swale that daylights down at the end of the street. That's the hydraulic relief. Another piece of structure, this is at the uh, Pine Du Bois uh, headquarters there, Jones River Watershed Association. This is to mitigate the outfall at her location. Uh, this is a 1500 gallon septic tank with a diagonal flexion wall in place. Works the same way as the manholes that we showed a moment ago. Flow comes into the structure, goes, uh, in this case here, you, this is the, the hole in, immediately in front of us this is the inlet side and there's a hole to the left that's going out to the leaching system. Um, you can see a pipe extending, it's already been put into the ground there. And once that leaching system is filled up, the top of this flexion wall is the same elevation as the top of the water we want to see in that leaching system and then it, it goes out over the weir and out the, the discharge pipe, which is also that hole in the, in the more distance there. Uh, in this particular case, the leaching system uh, was a little more sophisticated. We had to, because the soils were tight, um, in all these sites we do soil borings to get a sense of what the uh, soil characteristics are, but the soils were tight, we weren't going to be able to perk anything through those, so we had to over excavate and put uh, sands in there um, and bring the sands up just a little bit and then layer in some four inch perforated pipe, as you can see parallel there, and um, then come up with more sand and then some stone and these uh, plastic structures uh, to accommodate uh, volume as the, as the water comes in and then slowly perks out. You need to have a little bit of a, a capacity to accommodate that water. And then there's, so those four inch lines become an under drain and they come over to a header and they discharge out. Now looking at that septic tank from the other side, days later you can see the, the large 12 inch uh, discharge pipe, which is, uh, that accommodates the excessive flows and then the four, in, uh, that's now a six inch, that's a six inch line serving the headers that are uh, collecting from the four inch perforated pipe. So in this case here, we, we created our own treatment system of two feet of sand and then uh, with discharge out. Some of the earlier ones we wanted, to, other ones that we didn't show here, you got the sand, it just goes right into the ground. We never collect it. Those are, the, those are less expensive than, than something where you have to build it in, in its entirety. We saw plastic structures there. Those, those can be sometimes uh, proprietary. Here is a uh, four by eight leaching chamber, common structure, any precast concrete joint can give them to you in, in spades. Nice and shallow, 18 inches. So if you got a high groundwater table or issues, you want, a, you want a big footprint because you got tight soils. This is the kind of piece you want to use. Here's another kind of BMP. Uh, this is a uh, catch basin apron system in construction here. The top picture you can see the catchment area. We've collected all the water that we can and directed it to a, a leaching system, but there's a little bit left over and the groundwater is high. We're down near the ocean. And so uh, we, there's not much left we can do, but what we can do is we excavate around the existing catch basin, daylight that and, and also excavate a little further put some structure and backfill it with a lot of two and a half inch stone, which is about a 40% uh, void space. Then and with some protection, we bring it back up and at the top we put it on uh, a, a four inch cobblestone. Get a cobblestone reveal in front of the, uh, of the catch basin and it's lower than the catch basin. So water that's flowing on the street wants to go to that catch basin like it always has, but we put this big apron of of cobbles and stones voidable, with a lot of voids in front of it. And that all goes down and spreads around underground until that thing gets filled up. And then it'll daylight and it'll go up and over into the catch basin that you see. This is a, uh, a similar one down at uh, the town landing in uh, Kingston. You can see new pavement, water flows over and hits those cobblestones and uh, it's never gonna make it to that catch basin unless it's a huge rush of water. But remember, we've already intercepted a lot of water up, up gradient through other BMPs that we've put in place. This is like the last resort. Here's another last resort uh, in Duxbury, a little rain garden down at the end of the street. This is the Delano Avenue uh, Pace Whale Mitigation. Uh, this was a rain garden at the end of the street. This, this is an 18 uh, foot diameter structure. There's two of them down there. 
And uh, when they were in construction, we had a rain event that was pretty significant. Fortunately, nothing washed out, but you can see how these systems work. In this case here, the, uh, there's a catch basin grate in the middle of the rain garden, and that catch basin grate is upflowing with, with uh, stormwater runoff, spreading across the rain garden, and uh, percolating into the uh, very highly permeable soils amended for uh, growing plants. That rain garden, 18 feet diameter, about a foot tall with stone and then a six inch freeboard on top of that. Now you look here, you can see the rain garden in the background, it's all full up, just about ready to go over the top as it's notched into the hillside. But we have in the foreground, there's a four inch um, granite curb that's set at elevation so that the top of that curve is the same as the top of the water we want to see and no more in the rain garden. And once, because if it, if it were to be higher, then we could blow out one side of the rain garden. So the water comes down, hits the uh, a large uh, trench drain, which you can see under the water there, it's darker. And once that rain garden is full up, and they're both, both rain gardens have the same max elevation, then the water goes over the granite curbing and out over some riprap. So there's a, another picture of that rain garden. You can see water flowing over the, uh, the granite. And in this particular location, it was a heck of a rainstorm. There's a couple of websites I use to get real-time data and history on that. I got some unit price information here. This is just for planning purposes. So we've had nine contracts issued under CPR between these two towns. Imagine uh, two issues. You got a parking lot, 100 foot by 100 foot, 10,000 square foot parking lot. Or you have 400 feet of roadway, 25 feet wide. Again, 10,000 square feet. Well, how big, what's the size of your system gonna be? You know, what's it gonna look like? If you've got to manage a first flush, the first flush is a, a inch. Say it's, we'll call it a 10th of a foot. It's really 0.083, but we'll call it a 10th of a foot. So you got 10,000 square feet times a 10th of a foot. You got 1,000 cubic feet. What's it gonna cost? If you look at the first item, 1,000 cubic feet, unit cost per first flush volume, 1,000 cubic feet will run you 1,000 times 34.61, $34.61 plus or minus, and there's large variations here. So that's about $35,000, $36,000 BMP in place. And that would include catch basins, sediment systems, and leaching systems. Alternatively, you look at an item, the second item, it would unit cost per impermeal surface area, 10,000 square feet, that's uh, times $2.87 a square foot, that's 28, 29,000, so it comes out a little lower using that approach than the first approach. And of course, there's standard deviations because some of these projects get a little more involved than others. The last item ratio, BMP footprint per impermeable surface area. So in my example, again, we're talking 10,000 square feet. How many, what's the footprint gonna be of your leaching system or your rain garden? Well, it's gonna be 1.73 times 10,000 feet or 173 feet, call 200 square feet you'll have to set aside for either a rain garden at surface or buried as a, a subsurface uh, leaching system. That's basically it. This man is happy because he's Joe Grady who couldn't be here, so I'm here. And he's, <laughs> he's the guy with all the oysters. He's an oyster farmer up there. And uh, he has, has uh, inspired uh, Maureen Thomas in Kingston to get uh, 14, 15 years of grants and maybe some more. We'll have to see. Okay, thank you.